what uh, I want to uh, impress on you over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is about uh, an emerging field, about how the what if your behavior and your sensitivity to stress is all governed by the microbiome, uh, the, the microflora within your gut. And that's kind of where, and I'll take you on a little journey where, uh, about how the, uh, we've led to, to that kind of uh, quite provocative uh, uh, conclusion uh, and where we're going. And uh, as uh, Javier uh, would have mentioned, I am a, a, um, a neuroscientist, so uh, my, my uh, perception of the brain-gut axis is very neurocentric, and so I apologize to all the gastroenterologists in advance uh, for uh, I have a top down view of, of, of the brain gut axis, but uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, my lab has been interested in how stress uh, works, uh, and, and, and that's the context of how, uh, what we're studying. And so I'm from Ireland. Most of you know where Ireland is, but maybe not all of you know where Cork is. It, it, it's at the very south of Ireland, uh, just here. And uh, in a, maybe in, 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 in a Catalan version of the world, uh, 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 we have this uh, people in, from Cork uh, only consider it's the second city in Ireland, but uh, if you're from Cork, you only think of Cork as being uh, the only city in Ireland. And, 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 and in this world uh, where we work, uh, uh, it definitely uh, is the only place where we're doing this type of work. So the concept that uh, microbiology and, uh, and bacteria can, can, and, uh, can affect the brain is, 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 is quite uh, novel in some ways, but in other ways not. And, and these fields of medicine have evolved in parallel and uh, with only certain areas overlapping over time. Uh, in the field of uh, neurosyphilis, uh, well studied over 100 years ago, uh, and then more recently in the 1980s when it became clear that the spectrum of the AIDS virus was also impacting on brain function and cognitive uh, uh, effects. But, but other than that, and then uh, another, uh, uh, some other, air, uh, like hepatic, hepatic encephalopathy, the, 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 there's been very little uh, in, in, uh, on the overlap. Uh, between these fields. However, there's been a greater appreciation over the years that the brain and the body do closely interact and we have this mind-body uh, interaction and, and the brain-gut axis uh, has been uh, uh, clearly defined in terms of how uh, uh, the body uh, and brain uh, uh, closely uh, interact to maintain levels of homeostasis, which goes back to the work of Cannon and, and Darwin even uh, in terms of our understanding. And my last Lab is, is interested in, 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 as I said, in stress, and this is becoming more and more of a, pro a problem. Um, this slide is particularly for the American audience, but uh, uh, the, there are many stressors uh, in today's life, and, and uh, in Spain, as in Ireland, you're acutely aware of these uh, uh, overall, and uh, we're trying to understand how stress affects uh, the whole body, and uh, we, work, uh, we need to work on... Um, uh, animal models to help us to try and understand what's going on because for ethical reasons there is limits to what we can do in humans in relation to stress but so we rely on, on, on animal models but that brings with it its, its, its own problems and, and this cartoon from Gary Larson I like not just because it's an Irish setter but it helps uh, but it, 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 it emphasizes the difficulty that we have in trying to uh, um, parse complex human psychopathology in rodents and that we can't just put our rat or a mouse on a, on, on a couch and be able to try and extrapolate what the behavior actually means. Uh, and, and so some of the work we do, we, we, we use analogous tests to try and, 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 and bring this forward. But it is one of the major caveats and worth noting. Moreover, from an anatomical point of view, we have to highlight that the brains of rodents uh, uh, are quite different, not just in terms of size, but also in terms of uh, um, cerebral uh, elabora elaboration of the cortex here. Uh, the relative size of key areas is quite different. The hippocampus, which is very involved in cognition, learning and memory and stress modulation, is much, much bigger in a mouse than it is uh, in, in, in a human. Um, but we, what we know is that some of the key circuits underlying emotions, such as the fear circuits driven through the amygdala and, and the um, reward circuits that are very involved in experiencing pleasure, 
are relatively well conserved across uh, mammalian species and that therefore we can use at these models uh, with some level of um, confidence that we're actually uh, getting at uh, 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 an analogous situation to humans. And what's very important, the, the, the stress field uh, very much focuses on, on what's going on in the brain and on the circuits on, in the brain that are uh, underlying how we modulate stress and the hormonal and endocrine outputs by the HPA axis, uh, but we can't forget the immune system and uh, the impact of the stress on that, and all of that can feed back on the brain, and we're working in a circuit. And moreover, we can't, uh, it's very important to realize that stress impacts the whole body, and more and more we're realizing what, how stress uh, affects um, uh, gut function, and this includes work from Javier's lab and, and, and others in terms of its effect on motility, uh, on, on uh, um, responsivity to neuropeptides and epithelial barrier function, and, and Javier's work uh, uh, is, is very classical in this field. So we're, a, a picture has emerged of a stress affecting multiple parts of the body, and that these uh, different systems can interact with each other through key pathways such as the vagus nerve uh, to, to, to cross-modulate. And so th we're beginning to understand uh, more and more how, how there is this uh, stress-like uh, state. Moreover, stress isn't just stress. Stress is very, the, 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 the timing of when a stressor uh, is, is, is uh, given is very important. And we're quite interested in particularly in stress early in life. Because there is now a growing theory, and this, this um, uh, review, or uh, basically an opinion paper in, in JAMA from a few years ago from Bruce McEwen and colleagues, basically highlights that early life stress uh, could be at the underpinnings of many of the medical disorders that we see uh, moving forward and understanding how this happens and, and how uh, we can control uh, stress, uh, the, the, we would have a better insight into understanding the roots of some of the health disparities that emerge. And people are doing this now in large-scale epidemiological studies like those from the Romanian orphans who are now reaching a, an age of maturity and where the stressors are, 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 are well documented. It's also in popular literature. This is a very best-selling book in, in British and Irish, um, for British and Irish pregnant mums uh, to, to, to understand about uh, corrosive cortisol and things like this. And, and we're beginning to understand that stress at different p phases in life can have different impacts on the brain and on the HP axis and it have different outcomes overall. Um, and it's very important to understand uh, the, that um, it's not stress that kills us, but it's our reaction to it. And Hans Selye, who is the uh, father of all stress research, who coined the term stress, uh, uh, really brings us into this idea of resilience. And a lot of the stress field is focused on susceptibility to stress. But maybe that if we understood the resilience to stress more, that we could be more helpful in designing uh, uh, therapeutics. And this was all made the cover of nature at the back end of last year uh, uh, to try and, uh, and understand this. And we're getting at this at, at a brain point of view, but what about the rest of the body and understanding how the GI tract in particular is in, in certain individuals is resilient to certain stressors is, is quite important. And this is something that we've been working on in different mouse models, trying to understand why certain protocols of early life stress and certain genetic uh, backgrounds uh, are in particularly resistant uh, to um, uh, this early life manipulation in mice. And I won't go into the details because they're, they're uh, not uh, relevant right now. So a lot of our work in the context of stress has been in, on a functional bowel disorder called, known to many of you, and is irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, it, it's symptoms or abdominal pain, or, or, or abnormal uh, bowel function, bloating, uh, and biologically it's characterized by low-grade mucosal inflammation, exaggerated stress response, increases in plasma pro-inflammatory cytokines. Very popular with a female uh, bias. Uh, it's the most common disease diagnosed by gastroenterologists. And we were quite interested because of its large comorbidity with anxiety and depression and other stress-like uh, disorders. And we know from a natural history point of view that stress, particularly stress early in life, uh, plays a major role in the onset and exacerbation of symptoms and is largely now seen as a disorder of the brain-gut uh, axis. And um, however, how it's represented within the medical community varies. So gastroenterologists could see it as a uh, gut disorder. Psychiatrists often uh, see patients with it and would see it as a stress-related disorder. And neurobiologists and neurologists can see it as a chronic uh, pain disorder. 
The problem is, what happens is the gastroenterologist will say it's a psychiatric problem, the psychiatrist will say it is a chronic pain disorder, the, the neurologist will see it as a gastric disorder, and these patients get shuffled from one consult to the other a lot. And they, there's a huge unmet medical need to try and understand how uh, the, the, the disorder manifests and what are the, 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 the ways that we can actually effectively treat it. And there are very little effective treatments. So in terms of trying to model it in a, in, in, in a laboratory setting, our lab and other labs have been working on this, and, and we take advantage of our knowledge that early life stress in humans, uh, uh, about 50% of IBS patients will report some elements of, of early life stress. So we have a, a rat model of early life stress where we separate rat pups from their mothers during early life, and when they grow up, they develop a, a maternal separation phenotype. And so this is just three hours of separation for 10 days during the, the, the first two weeks of life. Um, and um, basically, when they grow up, they have large-scale changes in their stress response, in their uh, serotonergic system, in terms of transit, um, permeability, uh, inflammation. And uh, we've also shown that the diversity of the microbiota and I'll come back to this later, but it was also quite uh, remarkably different. So here we show changes in behavior, endocrine system, immune system, also changes locally in the gut, on the morphology of the gut, and on the function of the gut. So we're having a whole disorder of brain-gut axis uh, being encapsulated in this model of early life stress. And it, it, we find it a useful model to be able to uh, challenge some of the hypotheses that we have regarding the, uh, the um, uh, neurobiology and, uh, of uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Most importantly also is that when you test them for their pain response, and visceral hypersensitivity is a hallmark of irritable bowel syndrome, and when you test them for this, there is a, an exaggerated pain response and a lower threshold for uh, pain in these animals. And, and so therefore, uh, the, they develop a sensitivity uh, uh, to bowel distension, uh, just like irritable bowel uh, uh, syndrome patients. And we also have replicated this more recently, uh, but not as robustly. But, but, but we have found it also in mice, and so it's not a phenomenon specific to rats. But it, this is a model of early life stress. We've also started looking at a model of, of stress in adulthood, and this is uh, also a, a symptom uh, that we know it, it, it comorbid with uh, IBS patients. And in this, we use a chronic uh, model of psychosocial stress, because social stressors are among the most potent to everyone daily. And um, understanding how, how uh, we deal with social stressors is, is, is quite important. And in mice, uh, are, they're very, like humans, are very social uh, in, in, in their interactions. And so what we do is basically we um, have a, an intruder come into a, a cage uh, where there's a resident, and basically it beats it up. And uh, they're separated. Um, but, they're, but they're left in psychosocial contact. So it, it's like you're in, in an open plan office beside a bully at work, and you have to sit beside them every day and go to work and deal with them every day in a chronic situation. And you don't know when you're going to have to be in a meeting with them or interact with them, because we, we do this in, a, in an unpredictable manner when we, we do this, and we do this chronically. And what, we do, what, what happens is, in, in this situation, it develops quite a marked stress response. You can see here in terms of the adrenals, uh, quite uh, uh, grossly enlarged, and thymus function is, is declined. But also we get a, um, when we look at visceral pain, the visceral pain response goes markedly up. So it's another model that we're able to use to try and look at the mechanisms of what's going on. And finally, the other model, we have a shorter version of this that we've characterized over a six-day period, again, a social stress model. Uh, and the only reason I'm showing this is, that, is to point out that the resilience factor is quite important because over the days it takes a number it takes a number of days for certain animals to be, go into a submissive state over a dom when they are put in place with a dominant and then this correlates with changes locally in the gut in terms of gut morphology and at the microscopic level so what we're seeing is is a whole body stressor impacting both the brain the behavior and the gastrointestinal uh, tract so uh 
looking at the mechanisms that could underline some of these stressor and GS changes, well, we, we focused also on the spinal cord because the spinal cord is very important for uh, sensing of pain responses from the viscera to the, the brain. And uh, uh, we looked in particular at uh, the supporting cells. So we have neurons within the spinal cord, but we also have these supporting cells called microglia, which are analogous to immune cells. And basically what we were quite interested in was when a neuron releases a neurotransmitter glutamate, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, we have these uh, transporters on the, on the glia, which basically mop up uh, the glutamate and prevent it from ha having uh, too much uh, uh, toxic effects. And so basically, in a very simplified way, is that too much glutamate, you would get a greater pain response. So we have these transporters here, these excitatory amino acid transporters. And we were interested to see, could these transporters be uh, what's gone wrong in, for example, our maternally separated animals? And uh, what we looked at, we showed, was that there was a downregulation of these transporters in, uh, in the maternally separated uh, animals in the spinal cord, both measured by Western blot and immunofluorescence. And moreover, when we took a normal animal and when we gave it a blocker of this transporter, it now had the phenotype of the maternally separated animal. So basically, we were able to recapitulate what was going on uh, in, in this transporter uh, because of the uh, blockade uh, with this pharmacological agent. Now, what, what could this be used uh, clinically? Well, there's a drug called Rilazole, which is a, 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 a drug that's been marketed for the treatment of uh, ALS, motor neuron disease, but it is an activator of this transporter. And what we showed was that if you give this um, uh, compound, we're able to block the early life stress-induced visceral pain. So it's a mechanistic study showing that these transporters are a part, at least, playing a role underlying this brain gut axis dysfunction. More recently, we're interested in other aspect, other targets, and we're, we're, we're um, buoyed by data from our group and others showing that LPS, which is uh, um, from the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, we're able to show that LPS increases visceral hypersensitivity at relatively uh, low doses. And we were interested in how could this be happening, and LPS is a TLR4 agonist, and these toll-like receptors are the key regulators of the innate immune system, and there are different uh, TLRs, uh, TLR1 to, to, to 9, and they're present in different ways, and we were interested in whether there's a dysfunction in this uh, regulation in our uh, IBS patients and in our animal models. And, and indeed, when we looked at uh, PBMCs from IBS patients, we showed that there was a hyper uh, sensitivity to TLR ligands, in particular the TLR TLR4 and TLR8 as measured by uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine um, st uh, stimulation. And in our animal models, when we looked directly locally in the gut, we looked at the mucosa and the expression of the TLRs. We found that in the maternally separated animal and in another animal model that we, that we, we, we look at, which is the uh, Worcester Kyoto ras, we also found that there was a... Um, uh, upregulation of the TLR uh, signaling, and in particular TLR4 again, uh, as well as TLR5 and, and 3. So this tells us that aspects of the innate immune system are dysregulated and may contribute to some of the pain-related responses. So what we did was we looked at um, mice uh, that are deficient in TLR4 signaling, and we found that they have a blunted uh, uh, sensitivity to uh, visceral pain, dis uh, colorectal distension, so that they're, they're, they have a diminution of the pain response, and that when we stress these animals in this psychosocial bullying stress model, we found that th these m mice w were unable to mount the same stress response. So this tells us that TLR4 uh, is in part at least responsible for this chronic stress-induced effects. And then to verify this, we looked at a pharmacological inhibitor that has been tried in clinical trials for sepsis, which is TAC242, and, and with it, we were able to block the stress-induced uh, pain response. So again, it's another way that we're slowly parsing the neurobiology and, uh, of the visceral pain associated with irritable bowel syndrome. So what about the gut microbiome, and where does this fit in uh, to the uh, story that I've been telling you? Well, as most of you are aware, it's probably one of the most exciting areas in, in modern biology and medicine in general. And um, 
you know, it, the, the Meta Hit Project has met the cover of Nature, the human uh, microbiome project has, has met the cover of Nature. Last Two weeks ago, the New York Times magazine had a big cover and a big article about it. <clears throat> but um, it was only when it made the cover of The Economist that uh, our dean uh, started to kind of really uh, uh, take heed about uh, really this might be something worth uh, uh, investing in. And, and, and it re we're really beginning to understand that the protective structure of the metabolic functions of the microbiome uh, can extend to affect the whole body and affect both the brain and gut at different ways. And, and that's some of the ways that we've been interested in. It's also important because if you're interested in early life and early life manipulations as we are, uh, it's, it's worth noting that um, the um, bacterial coloni colonization and gut development in neonates is affected by many uh, both external influences and internal host properties ranging from uh, uh, the host uh, uh, immunity, the maturity at birth, the gut structure, epigenetic factors, as well as uh, antibiotics, and most importantly also the realization that delivery mode, whether by cesarean section or vaginally, it, it will have a marked effect on how uh, the composition of the gut microbiome occurs and uh, that, that this may have long-term impact on the health of the child overall. And a lot of effort is going in to try and understand that. Well, but we, what, where we lack a lot of knowledge still to date is how can the uh, microbiome in your gut signal to the brain and change behavior and change how we perceive stress. And there are some clear ideas, and I'll talk through some of them, including that they can release uh, agents such as neurotransmitters and short-chain fatty acids. They can impact the immune system. They can, through the vagus nerve, as well as uh, manipulate tryptophan and the, the alter tryptophan metabolism. And we, we've been working on some of these over time. And how do we do this? Well, in um, animal models, for example, we can uh, use germ-free animals. These are mice that are maintained in a completely uh, uh, microbiota-free environment, and we're fortunate enough in Cork to have one of these facilities. A lot of the early work has been in the infection field, because people who are, have been giving uh, mice uh, infections have been noting that their behavior is different, and sickness behavior has been very well characterized. Uh, so a lot of work has gone on in that context. Um, antibiotic studies as a surrogate to the germ-free in a more realistic fashion uh, at different phases in life, as well as uh, more and more studies now where animals and humans are being given probiotics and testing the impact of that on stress sensitivity and brain function. And then more recently, people are beginning to look at fecal uh, transplantation uh, as a strategy where the, the uh, microbiome from a human can be uh, transplanted into a germ-free mouse or, or a normal mouse or that from a mouse into another and be able to try and manipulate what's going on. The concept that, that, that the microbiome um, is, is modulated by stress isn't new, but it, 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 it was first highlighted in this paper from Tanak uh, back uh, 40 years ago, where he said um, that uh, stress mice uh, showed dramatic reductions in these populations of lactobacilli. It was ignored, it was microbiologists that didn't care about this too much. Uh, and it took some time uh, for other people to start looking at this. The work of Chris Crow and Mike Bailey, to, uh, many years later, looked at a very small study, and, but it was in monkeys, showing that early life stress disrupts the integrity of the intestinal microflora. Uh, and so this also helped to, to develop this. And more recently, they've looked at a, a, a another psychosocial stress model and looked at the... Um, uh, fecal content of the microbiome and found that it, the main finding in this paper was that they could correlate the relative abundance of certain rare microbial species um, such as uh, durea and um, uh, coprococcus uh, with uh, the levels of specific pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, in particular IL-6. Um, and this uh, my microbiology friends were more interested in that. I, I thought this was a bit of an out there uh, finding, but, but because these are relatively rare, it means that any change in them may have bigger effects and, and be able to induce long-term effects. But this is a, these are the, the few papers that we know of. And then um, we've been interested in the, using these germ-free animals that we have access to and seeing how uh, 
the animals grow up in a germ-free environment and how their uh, uh, ability to be modulated by stress. And this dates back to, again, a paper that came out almost a decade ago, but which wasn't really appreciated at the time from Sudo's group in Japan, and where he showed that germ-free animals, when you stress them, have an exaggerated response in terms of their hormone output, ACTH and corticosterone, the rodent equivalent of cortisol, very marked response, and that very neatly, when you gave these animals different uh, potential probiotics or probiotics, they, they, they examined, they were showing that bifidobacterium in particular were able to reverse this stress-induced effect. So i.e. if you were given a bifidobacteria, your ability to, to, to these germ-free animals, their stress response was, was not exaggerated. So uh, this was a very neat paper and it really is a classic in the field uh, now and is appreciated like that. Moreover, our group, as well as the, the McMaster group of, of Jane Foster and John Biedenstock and the Karlinsky group of Sven Pedersen have, have more recently highlighted that uh, germ-free animals uh, have alterations in brain development, uh, in particular that the levels of key neurotransmitters and neuromodulators within the brain is quite different in these animals and, uh, and coupled with changes in their corticosterone response and their um, behaviour. And this is just some data from our lab showing that the levels of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a, a very important support molecule within the hippocampus, is very uh, much implicated in depression and in learning and memory, uh, and, and, and it keeps the hippocampus very much in kilter, uh, but this is downregulated in the absence of microbiota. And again, this is just replicating the pseudo-data, which showing that there's an exaggerated stress response uh, in these animals. What about IBS-like symptoms? Well, what we've shown is that, it, 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 is that there's an exaggerated uh, stress response or a visceral pain response uh, in germ-free mice. And this is unpublished data, but data we're quite excited about. And when we put the uh, bacteria back into these animals post-weaning, uh, post we're able to reverse this. So this tells us that it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all that the wiring that has happened that it makes you susceptible isn't, uh, uh, can't be countered by uh, 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 certain bacteria being put back in later in life. But germ-free is a very artificial, uh, um, very neat tool to work with but it's still an artificial tool. What about a more realistic uh, um, challenge? And, and if my early life um, um, separation model isn't enough to stress uh, mothers who leave their kids in creche and daycare, like my own, uh, antibiotic administration will uh, scare you enough. Because uh, here we looked at what happens with um, uh, giving, and in this case it's vancomycin, but we've more recently re reproduced it with a, a cocktail of other antibiotics, where we looked at uh, what happens during early life if you're exposed to antibiotics. And what we found was, the good news was there was no change in cognition, anxiety, or distress response or immune, uh, crude measures of the immune system, but we got a very marked increase in visceral hypersensitivity, telling us that the gut microbiota early in life is very important for priming for your sensitivity to developing symptoms that are very uh, common in irritable bowel syndrome. And th this leads into the, the whole um, concept that we can use probiotics, uh, and this is something that my colleagues like uh, Eamon Quigley uh, in Cork uh, um, have been uh, championing for many years uh, in, in, in the context of using a variety of lactic acid bacteria for uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and, and there is um, good evidence that they do have a positive effect in IBS. And this is some animal data from our group, which is showing, again, in this Worcester Kyoto rat, it's a stress-sensitive rat strain that we use. Um, and we find that the, the uh, threshold uh, for uh, CRD uh, is increased when we uh, give them this bacteria, this bifidobacteria, and the number of pain behaviors is decreased. So there's an anti nociceptic effect of um, probiotics in this animal model. And this is also in line with previous data from the a French group, which it was published in Nature Medicine some years ago, showing that uh, a lactobacillus, in this case an, an acidophilus, uh, could modulate intestinal pain and upregulate uh, the 
concentrations of the opiate receptor and the cannabinoid receptor. Now, what this upregulation locally in the epithelial cell really means and how that communicates up to the brain has never been really teased apart, but it's still an interesting uh, finding. And because we're interested in early life, uh, one of the uh, disorders that, 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 that we've been thinking about a lot is, is, is infantile colic uh, because there is again a, a huge unmet medical need here and often patients uh, um, parents you know uh, would refer to it almost like an infant uh, IBS and so there is evidence within colic that uh, various probiotics do have positive effects uh, here with this study in uh, of lactobacillus and then in other studies also with uh, uh, lactobacillus showing positive effects in, in colic in, in terms of having uh, effect on this brain gut axis early in life. And then the concept of whether could potential probiotics in adulthood affect stress-related anxiety and depression. Uh, and this is a, a term, could we develop what we call psychobiotics? And then this is a term coined by Ted Dynan, who's a, um, the professor of psychiatry in Cork and a close uh, a colleague. And uh, he's coined, he coined this term psychobiotics. And this comes from some of our work, which has shown that long-term administration uh, to normal mice of um, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus uh, reduces anxiety. So basically, uh, stress-induced hyperthermia uh, is uh, when you're stressed, your body temperature goes up. I feel it myself now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but they, um, all known anxiolytics will reduce this. Um, so basically, they, uh, what we find is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very significant trend towards a reduction in stress-induced hyperthermia. They, this is an elevated plus maze, which is the most widely used test for looking for how anxiolytic drugs work. And basically, this is a mouse is allowed to explore an open or a closed arms of this maze. And mice have a natural tendency to explore, but they don't like open areas. So what, what you do is if you give this mice Valium or a ben, any type of benzodiazepine, they will, they will come out here, become quite reckless and spend more time out there. Uh, and any anxiolytic drug that's used clinically will do that. Um, but uh, otherwise they'll stay in the... Uh, and what we found is in these mice that have been chronically given uh, a probiotic, that they behave as if they're on Valium. So we get this increase. Moreover, um, this is a, 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 a behavioral despair test, which is, is uh, mice will, are good swimmers, but they don't like to swim. And so you put them in this inescapable situation. Again, this is something that a lot of us have to deal with uh, in terms of dealing with university or hospital administration. Uh, it's it, it, it's uh, an inescapable situation, and eventually you give up. Uh, and what we do know is that all um, uh, known antidepressants, including ECT, uh, um, will uh, in increase the time that the animal engages in escape or into behavior. So it's, it's a test that's sensitive to antidepressants. And so Prozac-like drugs in particular uh, work in this model. And our animals that have been given the lactobacillus behaved as if they were already on Prozac. And so you have, a, you have this reduction in immobility. Well, so that's behavior. What about physiology? And um, in particular, what we've shown in, in, in terms of cortisol response, when you stress animals, you get a very nice upregulation of the cortisol response, and that this is blunted in animals that have been pre-fed with the lactobacillus. So taking a bacteria for a number of weeks means that you respond to stress in a much better way, and it's better for the, the, uh, or, or for the organism, organism in terms of uh, maintaining homeostasis. So what about uh, brain chemistry? Well, what we looked at in particular in, the, in, this, in, the, in these studies, we looked at um, changes in the uh, molecular pathways that we know underlie how Valium works. And Valium works through the GABA-A receptor. GABA is the main inhibitory receptor in the brain. So we looked at, at the expression of the GABA-A alpha-2, alpha-1, and beta, uh, um, uh, GABA-B uh, receptors. And I won't go into it in detail, but just to highlight that there were marked changes in brain receptors uh, for GABA in, in the cortex, in the amygdala, in the locus cerealis, not so much, but in the uh, hippocampus, there was a significant upregulation and downregulation in the other regions, caused by just taking a bacteria for a number of weeks. And uh, this created, and we also found changes in learning, and I won't go into all the details, but this created a big um, uh, interest from the lay media uh, two years ago when it was published because it, 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 it now helps us define this concept that you could develop psychobiotics. But how could, it, how, how 
could this occur? Where, what is the mechanism as to how bacteria here in the gut is getting to the to signals to the brain to modulate how we respond to stress and threatening environments? Well, before I may have men I mentioned briefly the vagus nerve, and um, uh, it's a key signaler along this pathway. And so what we did was we, in collaboration with John Beanstalk's group in Canada, we um, severed the, the vagus nerve. And to make a long story short, when we did that, all of the effects uh, were abolished. So all of the effects of this particular bacteria are mediated through the vagus nerve, both behavioral and, uh, and neurochemical. So we're, we're coming to this concept that basically uh, what happens in the vagus nerve is it has the potential to uh, affect uh, emotion. And for people in, in the psychiatry area, this is not so new because people are using vagus nerve stimulation in certain, especially in the US, to treat uh, intractable um, depression as well as um, uh, epilepsy. So, but it's telling us that we now have a mechanism, at least, and potential for how uh, this could occur. The immune modulatory effects, the vagal nerve stimulation, we haven't even thought about really, but it could also play a role. So that's all mice mice data, and mice are nice, but they're not the whole story, and where is this going in terms of translational research into the human situation, and that's what a lot of people here would be more interested in, and it's a field that's been relatively slow uh, to move into the clinic. Um, there have been some studies, and I'll just highlight two of them. This one from 2011 uh, from a French group has shown that uh, administration of a cocktail of um, a lactobacillus and a bifidobacteria has the potential to have a anxiolytic effect. And, but the problem here is these are healthy students. They took healthy students and, and basically looked at their, their normal anxiety and showed that they could be modulated. So it's not a clinically relevant cohort, but it, it is a nice signal that you're getting a change in anxiety measures uh, in, in a placebo-blind uh, trial. But more recently, the group of uh, Emmer and Meyer uh, and, and uh, Kirsten Tillich at UCLA have shown the first neuroimaging study uh, of a, a, cock a Danone-based cocktail uh, of, of probiotics and have shown that key circuits that are underlying the neurobiology of visceral pain in particular, but because that's and in the emotional construct underlying pain, uh, and these regions include the prefrontal cortex, the cingulate, um, that these are modulated under resting state activity when they're given this fermented milk uh, uh, probiotic uh, product. And uh, it changed how they respond to uh, an attentional face uh, task. So we're getting to the stage where now uh, more studies are being done to, to validate uh, what's going on in the animal work. And, and in, in this study in particular, what it does is it says that you're able to modulate brain chemistry by giving probiotics. And that's something that we had shown in animals two years earlier. So it's nice to see that move forward and, and to see where the field will go. I mentioned fecal transplantation. This is uh, uh, um, um, a lot of receiving a lot of attention of late, uh, largely through the, the um, very important paper that came out in, in New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year and was editorialized uh, about uh, uh, the utility of uh, fecal microbiota transplantation for uh, C. difficile uh, infection and, and uh, how it is life-saving in such a, a disorder. But the question is then, uh, can it be applied to other disorders? Irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and what about behavioral disorders? And um, so a lot of work is, is going in to try and tease this apart. We have, we have one hint um, uh, from the group of Steve Collins in, in uh, McMaster, which is a really neat study, whereas they took advantage of the fact that two mice strains differ in their gut microbiota. These are NIH Swiss mice and Bab C mice. And they also differ in their innate be anxiety behavior and their innate behavior. So they were interested, well, could these be related? And so what they did was they took um, uh, NIH Swiss um, 
uh, mice and gave them the, the bacteria from the BABC and they became much more anxious. And what we're measuring here is the latency to step down off an elevated platform. And if you step down quite quickly, that, that means you are uh, not so anxious. But if you take your time and you're much more uh, uh, reluctant and hesitant, it gives you some idea that you might be more anxious or more stressed. And what they found was they were able to turn this animal into that animal by giving it the BABC microbiota. And more importantly, they did the opposite. They took the anxious animal and gave it the fecal uh, um, microbiota from the, the normal animal, and they were also able to change its behavior. So this has huge con uh, consequences in terms of how we move forward and, and, and that we may eventually, although um, uh, see therapies based around uh, fecal transplantation uh, in the area of brain-gut axis function. It also means that when people are doing C. difficile trials, they need to be very careful about the um, behavior of the, the, the donor and that they're not uh, transplanting some aspects of psycho psycho psychopathological consequences uh, and uh, that we not only need to screen for um, infectious disease and other things that people are very well looking after, but maybe you would want to make sure that you have a, a donor that has a, a normal microbiota overall. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, moving forward, one thing we're realizing is that bacteria are really good factories for producing neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. And uh, work from colleagues in Cork are, are, are developing specific bacteria, and this is, this is not genetically modified. We're just screening for bacteria that have the ability to produce certain neuroactives. And this is the paper showing you can get bacteria that produce GABA. So you can get GABA being produced directly by the bacteria. You can get a lot of different things. And M M Mark Light uh, has been working on this for many years. And Mark has, has, has uh, shown that you can get uh, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, basically all the neurotransmitters from certain strains of certain bacteria. And therefore, by selecting out certain strains, you could develop a, a, a very smart uh, probiotics for uh, GI disorders uh, in the future. Uh, the last thing I want uh, uh, to, to just to talk about today is, is, is something that has been a, a spectrum over this field uh, of um, brain gut disorders is in the context of autism. And it's something I've stayed away, with, stayed away from because uh, the, the, uh, it has a long and, and controversial history overall. But it, more recently, we, 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 we've been shunted in this by our, the data that we have. So I thought I, it was worth sharing with you. Um, very uh, important disorder in today's uh, society. Um, basically, um, relatively high percentage in the uh, general population. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. It has a four to one male to female ratio. Um, and it's basically associated with abnormal social interactions, impaired communication, and repetitive behaviors with lots of other comorbid symptoms. I didn't mention, but at the t when we did our germ-free studies on behavior, on tryptophan metabolism, and a lot of other parameters, we found that most of the changes we found were only in male mice. Female mice were, for some way, protected uh, from these, the, the, these changes. And that, that's important uh, in, in the context of where we went with this. So people have been hypothesizing for some time about does the human gut microbiota uh, contribute? And this is a nice review from last year, which looks at all of the clinical studies uh, that are out there. They're small. They're not very uh, um, uh, giving us clear answers. There is a hypothesis that perhaps clostridium overgrowth might be a cause or be releasing certain um, bioactives, but how that concentrations that they're producing get, are able to modulate the brain is quite controversial. But it is something out there. Then there's a, equally a number of, and, 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 and Feingold's group in, in, in LA has been the most uh, ad, strongest advocate of this. And uh, they, they really believe that uh, uh, C. difficile uh, overgrowth could contribute to uh, autism uh, and that you have this uh, spectrum of uh, immune changes that are, are giving rise to overgrowth of certain species and giving rise to disease-related immune uh, deficiency and that these neuroinflammatory uh, responses are at the heart of the disease. Um, 
But there is equally a number of studies, and this is a more recent one uh, from, from the end of last year, showing that when they looked at the uh, microbiota, there was no difference in the microbiota composition between autistic kids and, and, and controls, uh, what they call neurotypical. But this is a paper from our group, which we just published last week, where we looked at germ-free animals and looked at how they behaved when they were uh, uh, given uh, the chance to interact socially. And, and um, what, what we see is that if you give a mouse, because they're quite social animals, the chance to explore another mouse, a chamber with another mouse in it, or a chamber with an empty mouse in it, so that they, don't have to, they just have to sniff and smell and whatever else, most mice will spend more time with the mouse. They like to spend time, uh, and uh, we can measure this uh, behaviorally. Uh, however, our germ-free mice don't, at least in males. Uh, females also, we, have we, have, we, we had some deficits too. Well, and then the other aspect of, of social cognition is that if you put a mouse um, with a mouse that it's already seen, or a new mouse, it should spend more time with the new mouse. And what we find in our germ-free animals is that they don't recognize the previous mouse, so their social cognition is, is gone wrong. When we measured how they groomed themselves and, 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 and engaged in repetitive behaviors in a novel environment, we found the germ-free mouse uh, were also able to have exaggerated uh, repetitive behavior. And uh, I didn't show it here, but in the, in the paper we show that um, if you recolonize the animals yeah, after weaning, you can reverse this behavior and the repetitive behavior, but not this. So certain aspects are able to be recolonized. And so, th so this was just published last week, and it's, again, um, bringing forth this concept that your gut microbiota is important for brain development and that this can lead to deficits in social behavior uh, that, that are important for physiology. And finally, the, the last thing I want to talk about is some, some clinical data we have, which is if you believe in a brain-gut axis and a brain-gut microbe axis, um, then what is the consequences to the brains of people with these disorders? So irritable bowel syndrome we've talked a lot about, and it's what does it mean to have uh, an exaggerated stress response and an exaggerated uh, pain response and an exaggerated immune activation? And so we hypothesize that all of these three can, can impact on cognitive functioning. But no one has ever really looked uh, in a parametric fashion at, 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 at cognition uh, in these um, patients. And we know other things can impact, like the microbiota, like menstrual cycle, like sleep disturbances and mood disorders. So these all converge. And so um, Paul Kennedy, who's a, who's a PhD student of mine, but with a psychology background, was interested in, in testing this uh, using the CANTAB uh, assessment, which is a widely used uh, touchscreen-based uh, cognition testing device that has been shown to uh, pick up early signs of Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive deficits. And so we're, we look at different aspects of, of memory and, and attention and set shifting and um, uh, spatial working memory, as well as uh, the classical Stroop attentional tests. Uh, and these are the, 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 the tests. So it's basically like a little video game, and you have to remember w the, the, where the position of different objects, the size of them, and relative to where they've been before. And each task is a different goal, and each task activates different brain areas. And these have been very well delineated in the neuropsych uh, literature. Um, and we anticipate that IBS patients should have a lot of problems with attention, and because of uh, 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 that, that would be the domain most widely uh, affected. And indeed, it wasn't. Um, and in in um, parallel, we felt it was worthwhile, and, and this was in collaboration with Fergus Shanahan, uh, that we wanted to look at uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And this goes back to a lot of data showing that stress is not only a, a predisposing factor for functional bowel disorders, but also for inflammatory bowel diseases. And this is a really nice uh, prospective study from Charles Bernstein, which shows that all of the major uh, factors that are pre known to predispose to um, uh, IBD, such as smoking, um, uh, antibiotics, NSAIDs, all, all of these that have been implicated in the past, that the only thing that he found that, that was actually uh, known as a trigger for flare-ups were all related to stressful life events and, and uh, low uh, mood. And so that basically we're able to, you know, there is a really strong interaction between stress and inflammatory bowel disease, and that this could 
also converge at a cognitive level because we know stress affects cognitive function. And these are unpublished data, but uh, just to share with you uh, what we found, and again, there is a big difference between IBS and IBD, but what we found was that in, in IBS that we found a hippocampal task, which is a visual spatial memory, which involves the clear regions of the brain. This was uh, impaired in IBS patients uh, significantly um, and not in Crohn's disease patients that are in remission, whereas in Crohn's disease patients in remission, we do get these attentional deficits. So that there is a, a, a functionally brain uh, uh, symptoms that are relevant uh, to the, 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 the Crohn's disease cohort. And these are just early days, simple studies, but just pointing out that we can't neglect uh, looking at brain function in patients with gastrointestinal disorders, that these are quite important, as well as, as, as some of the more uh, commonly used uh, uh, um, uh, syndromes that, that are tested for. So in, in conclusion, what I hope I've impressed on you today is, is, is that um, stress uh, will impact on the microbiome gut-brain axis, and that under healthy conditions, we have normal behavior, cognition, emotion, pain responses, healthy levels of inflammatory cells and mediators and normal gut microbiota. However, during stress and disease, um, there is abnormal gut function, abnormal flora, or normal inflammatory, and that this leads to a normal CNS function and vice versa. But it's a chicken and egg scenario, which comes first. And again, understanding what happens in terms of early life might be important to to, to uh, tease this apart, but we do know that there, what, what was happening down below can have very serious effects for what's happening upstairs. And so I leave you with this cartoon, which came out in the Daily Mail when our uh, PNAS paper was published, which uh, highlights uh, maybe where the depression uh, is coming from. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take some questions. <laughs>